Michael, for filling us in and, and educating us on what this trip is going to be like. And I'll turn it over to you and go ahead and start. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Patty, for asking us to join you today and share our experiences in this, what is really the most remote and stunning region of the world. Um, I know Michael and I are really excited to be working with you and Cruising Co to offer our journey to Antarctica, the White Continent, aboard the National Geographic Explorer on December 27th, 2016. So I wanted to use the opportunity today to go over a little bit of our history and take us back to the very beginnings of Lindblad Expeditions, because to truly understand and appreciate our expeditions, you need to know a little bit about who we are. Now this wonderful gentleman in this red jacket is Lars Eric Limblad, and he believed that by taking lay travellers to remote and pristine destinations, letting them learn, experience and feel the place, they'd return as a potent force for the preservation of those regions. And that really is what we still do to this very day. Now Lars Eric is regarded as, as the father of ecotourism and was literally the very first travel company to take travellers where only scientists had gone before. The first to take citizens, citizen explorers really to Antarctica and the Galapagos. Now since 1979 his son Sven Lindblad has expanded that legacy by providing travel experiences in the world's most remarkable places. Now Sven has maintained his father's legacy and his own appetite really for finding new ways to experience existing places. Today we have 10 ships located around the world offering expeditions from Antarctica to the Arctic. Sven has also added some really cool groundbreaking programs at our um, on our expedition, backing in the polar regions and Galapagos, an undersea program that really reveals the ocean's mysteries of wellness to enhance the tonic of wellness benefit that our expeditions provide and a, and a one of a kind expedition photography program. Of course, conservation and stewardship has been a primary concern from day one for all of us. They really do say seeing is believing, but we believe seeing is inspiring. Now we also believe that an expedition is arguably the most exhilarating travel experience a person can have. Nothing else even comes close to approximating its authenticity and all five senses engagement. And there's no one more qualified to deliver that authentic expedition experience than we are. Now Sven also forged alliances and the most important one is our alliance with the National Geographic Society. For over 125 years, the National Geographic has sponsored expeditions worldwide as part of their mission to bring us the world and everything in it. And for 50 years, we've been bringing curious, intelligent travellers out into the world on our expedition ships. So together, we're able to offer you and your clients the world's ultimate authentic expedition experiences. You could kind of say that it's in our DNA. Now the heart and soul of all of our expeditions are our expedition team members. In Antarctica we travel with the most experienced ice team and our Lindblad field staff have been exploring the Antarctic wilderness for decades, almost 50 years, with diverse areas of expertise. Our expedition staff to guest ratio is 1 to 10 for plenty of one-on-one -on -one ex opportunities which really do allow you to see and learn more. So you have your expedition leaders, your naturalists, your undersea specialists, your National Geographic photographer, your global perspective speakers, wellness specialists and of course our video chronicler. For the places we visit you really should expect to see a full 360 degree view of the world because 50% of the experience is beneath us in that amazing marine world below the ship. So Lindblad leads the way with our continued introduction of leading edge technology. From our underwater specialists, it gets pretty cold down in Antarctica and up in the Arctic. These men and women dive into that marine world and bring back amazing photography to share with us at our evening briefings. We also have our video chroniclers who capture all of our expeditions so that you have a professional video that really is visual proof of your intrepid, tri of your intrepid spirit to relive your memories and, and that really is National Geographic quality, it's put together on the ship and you're able to take that with you at the end of your expedition. 
we have hydrophones because it's great seeing whales breaching, but if you can hear them before they break the surface of the water, that adds a whole new dimension. Video microscopes, so you can see down to the smallest little animal in the water beneath us. It really does change your perspective. You're sitting on a huge living organism. And we also have remote operated vehicles like the one you see here, which can go down to a thousand feet below the ship and beam back amazing visuals of what's happening beneath us. Now I mentioned kayaking earlier, Lindblad pioneered kayaking in the polar regions and that allows us to explore up close and independently for personal discoveries. Now Explorer carries a fleet of 36 virtually untippable kayaks and this allows you to get out there, paddle around and I don't think you can get much closer than this. Actually this is a photograph that Michael took, um, I think it was earlier this season Michael and that's a minke whale. These are really easy to board, easy to manoeuvre, even for novices and it really is a great way to get access to the wildlife of the Antarctic region. Now our zodiacs provide us with the freedom to explore. We can get out daily in search of adventure. They allow us to land and explore pretty much anywhere in the wilderness. Um, you can get off the ship at a moment's notice. So if we see whales, if we see penguins on the ice, we can deploy the zodiacs, and get up close and personal, great photographic opportunities. They really do make all the difference in the world. And there's simply nothing like our expedition photography program anywhere else. This was really born out of our expeditionary heritage. It offers exclusive programs and some three real key benefits for our guests aboard. We have our National Geographic photographers aboard every departure of the National Geographic Explorer and of course also our other ship, the Orion. Our Lindblad National Geographic certified photo instructor aboard every other ship in our fleet plus highly immersive photo ex expeditions designed by photographers for photographers. Not only do you have the chance to travel to incredible places like this trip to Antarctica aboard well-equipped ships with renowned expedition teams and like-minded travellers, you also have the opportunity to travel with top National Geographic photographers at your side and they're there to help you and to inspire you and to assist you. You can take advantage of talks, presentations, slideshows, sharing events we call laptop galleries all skills and interests are catered to, um, from your iPhone, point and shoots to DSLRs. Plus our unique partnership with B&H Photo and Video really can help you gear up for your trip. Um, we have wonderful curated lists of special gear with special pricing for all of our booked guests. So make sure you look for that in your expedition documentation and your online documents. A lot of people always ask me about the age of guests aboard our ships. Expedition travel is not an age, it really is a state of mind. If you're inquisitive, you want to learn, you want to become immersed in a destination, see all aspects and experience the world in a much deeper way, what we do is absolutely perfect for you from families to solo travellers to couples. Our guests do not want to be passive tourists, they want active engagement, they want to be up close and they want experiences and they want choices. So now a little bit about the wonderful ship that you'll be travelling on, which is the National Geographic Explorer. She was inaugurated in 2008 and is truly the world's ultimate expedition ship. She really is the embodiment of the Limblad Expedition's National Geographic Alliance. Her design and equipment is the result of almost 200 years of collective expeditionary experience. She's uniquely equipped with an ice strengthened hull, advanced navigation equipment for polar expeditions, great expeditionary tools for the, all that underwater exploration and a well-appointed interior with vast expanses of glass so that you have amazing views of the ice as we travel through. She's fully stabilised, she's an ice class expedition ship and that allows us to go further with the greatest safety in the polar regions we visit plus we explore, as I said earlier, with the very best ice team. You have as I said, your expedition leaders, your undersea specialists, all of that team is there to assist you throughout your expedition and ensure that you have access to the information and the knowledge that you want. Now all passenger ships plying polar waters are equipped with global maritime and distress safety systems. However, more technology is available that can be harnessed for greater travel safety and we have some amazing instrumentation that has been added 
to the Explorer to really make travel to the poles safe. She has forward-facing sonar, double weather forecasting, ice radar, ice lights, emergency communications. And actually we have um, the International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators Emergency Response System. And that was actually developed by our VP of Marine Operations, Leif Skog. He's our Ice Master and Captain of the Explorer. And it really does ensure that ships in Antarctica keep in daily touch to form the initial response for any incident. So it means you have and will be traveling on the most advanced vessel in Antarctic waters. Now, the National Geographic Explorer offers a welcoming haven after an exhilarating day out. You coming back on your zodiacs, she has accommodation for 148 guests in 81 cabins. Now, 13 of those have private balconies, six spacious suites, and we do also have cabins that are specifically designed for solo travelers. She's really spacious and modern, and our staterooms are from 170 to 388 square feet with queen size beds. Cabins are really inviting, great signature linens and duvets, really thick terry robes. You really do feel at home and comfortable and warm. Now part of the joy of traveling on the Explorer is the contrast. One moment you're going to be out there on, those ice, uh, on the icebergs surrounded by penguins and then you're going to be back and you're going to be able to have a hot shower, grab a cocktail, enjoy a glass of Malbec and maybe a wonderful dinner. And, and dining really is an integral part of the expeditionary experience for us. We always have the influences and flavors of the regions that we're exploring, along with more traditional fare. Now, all food is prepared aboard and is sourced locally whenever possible from sustainable providers. And we've done that from the very, very beginning. Now, all our seafood served is sustainably caught and raised, and that is a really big part of the experience of traveling with us, learning about what is, about, what is sustainable and where you can purchase it as well. Well. It's very much an informal style dining, a single seating at tables that are unassigned, allows you to mix and mingle with different people each night. There's never a need to dress up, ever. This is about relaxed, casual comfort. Meals are served in either our dining room or and um, the more intimate bistro bar. And once again, you sit with whom you want, when you want. Uh, the guest to crew ratio when it comes down to our overall crew is one to two. So you can see that you're always going to have someone there to help you. The library, now this is a fully glass in case library up on the top deck. It is the perfect place to not only research the regions we're visiting, but to really sit back with a cup of coffee early in the morning or late in the evening and watch that amazing scenery as it floats past us. Of course, wellness and rejuvenation is a huge part of what we do. There's a great fitness spa, um, center on board, and we also have a spa. Um, so there's great uh, massage options. So always take advantage of those on our sea days as we cross the Drake Passage. But now on to the most important part of the evening, I want to introduce, introduce Michael Nolan. Michael is a naturalist and Limblad National Geographic Certified Photo Instructor. His photos have appeared in calendars, magazines and books in over 45 countries. He is a master diver who has also traveled the world's oceans and specializes in capturing images of marine mammals. So take it away, Michael. Oh, Lisa, thank you very, very much. Good evening. Thank you, Patty. Lisa, I have to tell you, as I'm sitting here listening to you talk about the ship, the wonder of the ship, uh, it is incredible. You've got me, me very, very excited about this. And uh, I've done this now for uh, 44 times. I'm sorry, I'm just minimizing this here. It looks like we got a little... Uh, yeah, I need to hide it. There we go. Uh, and I'm sitting in the desert heat of Tucson, Arizona at 108 degrees and salivating about the upcoming season. Now, let's be honest. When you first hear from a friend or from anybody about going to Antarctica, traveling to, uh, to Antarctica, I know for many people they think, what in the world is this person I'm talking to thinking of? Why would you go to the coldest, the windiest, the highest, and the driest continent on the entire planet. Well, I hope I've got just a few minutes to tell you why, because of all the places that Lindblad Expedition goes, I can say honestly that 95% of expedition staff, if they were told, look, you get one more trip and you're done, they would choose Antarctica. They literally would choose Antarctica. It is that amazing and that special. 
When you look at Antarctica, you see a snow-covered, ice-covered, huge place. But where we're going to go and where we're going to concentrate, to me, I kind of see a little bit of an elephant head here with a trunk reaching up towards South America in the northwest corner up there in the upper left part of your screen. That is the Antarctic Peninsula. And that's where the vast majority of Antarctic life exists. And this is the part of Antarctica that we're looking to go to that we're going to take you to in December of 2016. And here is the peninsula itself. And you can see that it's just chock-a-block full of islands. Michael. We've got the Weddell Sea on the right. Hello? Michael, we can't no, see your correct. screen. Oh, yeah, we can't see anything. I was just going to say. You need oh. to, you need to well, clear your screen. Well, I got it up full, so. You should have gotten a message. Let me see. How can we remedy it? You reboot and see. You should have gotten a message that you need to say yes, that you're prepared to share your screen. Okay, so let's see if uh, I got that. There's my PowerPoint. No, I am showing when I go into my Safari. I'm, I'm going to make Lisa the presenter again, and then I'll, I'll okay. And then I'm going to revert it right back to you, Michael. Okay. <laughs> and and it's okay. Now Michael, see. try. It should pop right up on your screen. Okay. Not Lisa. You'll need to take it back over. Show my screen. There we go. There we go. Now okay. you can show your PowerPoint. Uh, now let's do PowerPoint. Well, I'm sorry. I thought you were <laughs> right along <laughs> with me there. Uh, I'm going on. All right, so let's start that slideshow. Yay. Minimize awesome. this. And I should be able to even get that just off. That looks good. That's perfect. Okay, we so you have the little, uh, you've that. got yeah. just the full image? Yes, we yeah, did. You're good. Okay, perfect. All right, so let me go ahead and this. All right. So we're looking at the Antarctic Peninsula, and as you see it, you can see all of the islands on both sides of the peninsula. To the right or east of the peninsula is the Weddell Sea, uh, and then we've got western, uh, the ocean to the west of it, just chock-a-block full of islands and chock-a-block full of life. And this is the amazing place. And of course, this area is just full of history, the golden age of exploration, stories like Shackleton, and all manner of different Arctic and Antarctic explorers who came down into this area in the, well, Captain Cook discovered one of the islands close to Antarctica in 1775. I'm going to go that far back to Captain James Cook. But it really wasn't until the 1800s that we started seeing sealers and whalers show up into Antarctica and the golden age, uh, age of Antarctica. The Shackleton times were in the early 1900s. So we're talking about something that's really kind of recent. And when you think about the idea that on our planet, we as humans have put away one entire continent that nobody owns. Nobody owns Antarctica. How amazing is that? You're going to a continent that no country owns or uh, uh, has exclusive use of. And so it really is kind of the world's playground and the world's shared spot. Now, there's no way around it. Your ticket to get to Antarctica includes the crossing of the Drake Passage. And the Drake Passage will start out in the tip of South America in Tierra del Fuego in a little city called Ushuaia in Argentina. And it will take you for 600 miles across the Roaring Forties, the Furious Fifties, and the Screaming Sixties. Those are the latitudes that you have to cross in the Drake Passage to get to Antarctica. And that area is famous. I mean, it's a world-famous area because there is no land anywhere on the planet that stops wind from coming through the Drake Passage. We are further south than the southern point of the South Island of New Zealand. We're further south than the southernmost point of South Africa. We are really down south. The great news is, is that the National Geographic Explorer is fully stabilized. She takes seas that are 12 feet, 15 feet, 18 foot seas, and she just gives us a smooth, smooth ride. It really is amazing the technology that is in the ship to get us down here. So the Drake Passage is where we will cross. This is where we'll join the peninsula. 
And then it's a true expedition. There's no way for me to tell you what spots you would go to on your expedition because it is always dependent on ice, it's dependent on animal sightings, it's dependent on what is the best thing. It's true expedition. We should have a huge bumper sticker on the back of the ship saying, we break for whales. Because if it's whales, we're going to stop and we're going to look. As Lisa was mentioning, if an ice flow goes by, it's just chock a block full of penguins or seals, we'll launch the zodiacs and go. So let me kind of give you an idea of what a day in Antarctica would be. First off, recognize that you were there in the austral summer. December 22nd is the longest day of the year in Antarctica, the austral summer solstice. Your expedition begins on December 27th. So you're there for 22, 23, and almost 24 hours of light. So the days are long. The light angles are beautiful. You can be up almost all day long and be out and being able to see in this time of year in Antarctica. We will be going ashore for hikes. Those hikes range from anything from just kind of staying ashore to really stretching your legs, really climbing whatever level you want to go. You can go on these hikes. Um, and there's, of course, incredible animals to see, and I'll talk more about that. Lisa mentioned the kayaking, the idea that Lindblad Expedition pioneered kayaking. These kayakings, kayaks are almost untippable. I mean, I've never seen anything happen with them. They're inflatable, expeditionary, self bailing They are phenomenal because they allow you to get right next to things like seals, things that are on ice. The penguins, of course, are going to be there. The wildlife is going to be there. I personally feel that the, the lifeline, the heart of the expedition, though, is the Zodiacs. We will spend time in Zodiacs. Zodiacs are military specification vessels that they take us to shore. We do cruises. We go around ice. We get looking at whales. And I just want to show you some images of kind of what it looks like and what a day in Antarctica could be. Now, in terms of weather, once we join the Antarctic Peninsula, we are now being totally moderated by the ocean. So air temperatures are going to be very, very comfortable. And on a day like this image shows, a clear sunny day, which is pretty common in Antarctica, you're actually going to feel warm. It'll hit into the 40s and 50s. And I've seen people take their jackets off and get down to just t-shirts. But the animals are going to be curious and are going to approach. We're going to get right next to them. These are little daily penguins, ice-dependent penguins. We have three different species of the smaller penguins that we'll get to see. The beautiful thing about the timing of your expedition is that you will see penguin chicks. Penguins first come back to the ice that they're going to have a breeding colony at sometime in October or November. They start their courtship. They start building the nest. They go through their mating ritual. And depending on the species of penguins, 30 to 35 days after those eggs are laid, the chicks hatch. And what we know is chicks start to hatch just before Christmas. So your timed arrival is perfect to see newly hatched chicks and even some chicks being hatched. So the, the timing is just perfect, in my opinion, uh, for the penguin colonies. You're right there at the crux of the time. Penguins do a lot of crazy antics. You're going to get to see things like this coming out of the ocean, leaping clear of the water to get up onto the ice. And the beautiful thing about Antarctica is there's absolutely nothing there on the ice or land that is going to eat you. I mean, I say that because, of course, we run trips to the high Arctic, where polar bears are a real and constant threat. In Antarctica, we encourage you just to take your time, find a penguin colony, sit down beside it, and just enjoy. And these little guys are so curious. They're going to come to you. They're going to surround you. They're going to be pecking at your boots. They're going to be looking at you and wondering, they're just as curious about you as you are about them. Of course, bigger animals are there as well. Seals. There are five different species of seals that we commonly see in Antarctica. And this is a, just a beautiful look at a Weddell seal. And you can see we can get very, very close. This is the Explorer. This is on Brown Bluff in the uh, Weddell Sea. This is a leopard seal on an ice floe. And you can see the zodiac can get right there. And I have to tell you, this little Adelie penguin is taking its life in its hand because that seal eats Adelie penguins. And it better not get too much closer to the seal. But these are the kind of encounters we have every day. Lisa mentioned the underwater stuff. More and more folks are bringing waterproof cameras with them, whether it's a GoPro or one of the little waterproof Olympus or Nikon or Canon, all make waterproof cameras. And when we get these encounters with SEALs, people are just slipping their cameras over the sides of the Zodiac. 
because you have access to the ocean and coming away with images like this. And the seals just curious and coming right to the cameras. So really, really exceptional. Now for me, I came to Antarctica because of the wildlife. And I'm a cetacean biologist. That's my thing is whales and dolphins. And I've got to tell you, Antarctica is one of the best places in the world to see and study and watch whales. This is a humpback whale breaching in Antarctica. This animal has come down from tropical waters off the coast of Brazil all the way to Antarctica just to feed. And the reason that it comes down here is that in Antarctica there's a species of small shrimp-like animal called a krill. And there are so many of these krill in Antarctica that they literally outweigh the weight of all humans on the planet. If you take 7.2 billion of us and take our weight, there are more weight in these one-inch krill on the planet than there are in humans. And the whales know it. And they come down to feed. And we get these encounters with whales. Again, this is a humpback whale feeding right up against the bow of the National Geographic Explorer. These are the kind of things we see. These are the kind of things we hope for. And they're very, very curious in their feeding. And we are just stopped dead in the water and the whales are kind of using us as a way to uh, push the krill into a ball and to feed into them. And we get these encounters where the whales are right beside the ship, and it's amazing because you can look right down into the water and see them and be, be right off the bow with them. And the big ship is such a beautiful platform. But as I mentioned earlier, the zodiacs get you to eye level. They get you to water level. This is a curious minke whale. This is in Paradise Bay in Antarctica. And just this was a two-and-a-half-hour encounter where this whale just kept circling our zodiacs and just posing for pictures. And again, as curious about us as we were about it. And you can see just amazing that this is happening, a wild animal, and here just really, really surrounding us. Humpback whales coming right next to the zodiacs, right beside us. Photographers are just loving it, of course, and clicking away. And, and I don't know if I can express it with an image how exciting it is to be in the presence of these animals in these zodiacs. This is a killer whale actually looking for seals on ice to hunt with. And here it is right off of the zodiac. So these are the kind of things that we're looking to provide, looking to see, looking to show you, looking to share with you. It's just this plethora of life. Now, as I mentioned, I'm a wildlife photographer. I was drawn by the wildlife. But the reason I go back year after year after year is the ice, the crazy shapes that the ice forms. You think that you've seen it all, and then along comes an iceberg that is totally different than anything you've ever seen. The shapes, the sizes, the colors, the forms, the arches, it is absolutely amazing. Now, Lisa talked about the National Geographic Explorer and how amazing she is to, uh, set up to go through ice. She is a 1A super ice class hull. The only thing stronger is an ice breaker is designed to push through a meter to a meter and a half thick of ice and to do it safely. And one of the funnest things you can do on a ship is exactly what these people are doing. Up on the bow while the ship is pushing through ice and just watch as the ship cleaves and breaks through the ice. And so it's really, really fascinating. We get next to huge tabular birds. This is a shadow of the ship uh, just to give you an idea of how big some of these icebergs can get. And we'll be watching these and looking at these and they're all about us, the entire expedition. And because you have so much light, you've got a lot of opportunity to see birds. Antarctica is about the ice. And it is everything from little pieces of brash ice up to the big icebergs and, and everything in between. I think most of us would tell you who've got many, many trips here, it is the ice in all its iterations, all its forms that really makes this exciting. Uh, it just yeah, I mean, I hope you could just hear the excitement of my voice. I'm, I'm just dreaming about going back again uh, because it is just incredible. And those low light situations where we've got an almost full moon and beautiful, beautiful sunset light, this is at midnight. I mean, this is this late of a shot that uh, you can stay up and you can see this kind of stuff. So just incredible. This shot was taken after midnight. This is a bird that's, uh, oh gosh, this is three years ago, I think now. And just one of those incredible nights. Flat, calm water, just blood red sky, and the ocean turning blood red, and, and the icebergs just beautiful, beautiful blue. So incredible stuff, incredible stuff. As you mentioned, lots to do or not. You can hang out on the ship. You can be as active or inactive as you want. 
Some people will come ashore and just hang out with penguins on the beach. They'll find a fun penguin colony and sit down beside it. Some people want to stretch their legs. They want to climb up. They want to go far. And again, the beautiful thing about Antarctica is you can do that. We don't have to stay in tight groups. You can do what you'd like to do. You can explore at your own pace. You can go and run and look and hide and slide and do all manner of things. Or you can just kind of take it easy ashore. Whatever you want to do, the pace that you want to set is there and available to you in Antarctica. Now when the day is over, we're finishing up and getting ready for dinner. A Lindblad tradition is to gather in the lounge, and this gives you an idea of how beautiful the lounge is. This is on one of the upper decks. And gather in the lounge and we do what we call a recap, a recapitulation of the day's event. And this is our global perspective speaker. Now this happens to be Sven in this image, but it could be a historian telling you more about the area that we're in. Or maybe we're talking more about the humpback whales that we saw that day. Or the undersea specialist is going to show you underwater video or underwater imagery. So at the end of the day, it's kind of finishing up uh, cocktails and then dinner. And then oftentimes, we will actually do a landing or zodiac cruise after dinner. Because the light is still good. Remember, it's being light till 11 or 12. So you're finishing up dinner at 8.30 or 9 o'clock. And oftentimes, we'll offer an after dinner uh, opportunity as well to you to go explore or to explore a little further. So the staff, as Lisa was mentioning, just incredible experience level, depth of knowledge, a specialist in all sorts of different fields as well as generalists. We've got bird specialists, we've got whale specialists, we've got ice specialists, we've got historians, we've got people whose lives are drawn to and all about Arctic exploration and Antarctic exploration. They love the polar uh, area. The joke, of course, is that uh, most of us are bipolar because we spend the respective <laughs> summers in either the Arctic or in the Antarctic uh, because it just is so incredible. So a really amazing group of staff and a group of uh, fun people as well. And this particular image, I think, just kind of sums up, to me, one of the greatest things about Antarctica. And that's going to be the idea that, look what the ship has done. We have literally rammed the National Geographic Explorer into the ice, into the fast ice. This is frozen ocean. These folks are standing on hundreds of meters of sea on about a meter and a half of ice. And they're nowhere near land. This is just ice, and you're standing and playing on frozen ocean. So it really is kind of amazing. Uh, this gives you an idea of pushing through ice, just the look of the ship as she comes out always room on the bow. There's always room on the mid deck there. You can see people up just in front of what we call the chart room. And there's excellent viewing from the very top of the ship uh, to really get a good 360 look around. So this is a good look at the ship and how it looks when you're out and out and running around. So I hope I've been able to convey at least a little bit how amazing of a place Antarctica is. Next time somebody asks you why in the world would you ever go to Antarctica, you can simply roll your eyes at them and say, you just don't know. You don't know the magic. So I'm actually hoping to uh, be on that expedition. Our schedule isn't set yet, but uh, I know you're going to have a phenomenal expedition. And yeah, thank you very much for the chance to, to share my perspective of it. Hey, Thank thanks, you. Michael. I, I just wanted to, to add a, a, another two cents, maybe. Um, for me, being on the ground in the United States and having the opportunity to work with these amazing men and women who are on our ships in the field, um, it is really so exciting to hear them present because th they really are the embodiment of who we are. It's their passion that ignites our guests when they're aboard. And so, um, all, most of that, I think all that photography tonight down in Antarctica was Michael's, and it is just absolutely stunning. So thank you for sharing that with us, Michael. Oh, it's been such a wonderful, I mean, it's been 10 years for me, and uh, this season I'll be there six different times, so it's, it is, it's a place to go to year after year after year. I don't think I'll ever see everything that Antarctica has to offer. Wonderful. Hey, Patty, do we have some questions? Um, yeah, if you could maybe just talk about um, how difficult or how easy it is to get in and out of the Zodiac boats. Um, absolutely. So the Zodiac, of course, with only one or two exceptions, and there are exceptions in Antarctica where it will be a dry landing. I mean, there are a couple of whaling stations, abandoned whaling stations, that we sometimes 
will visit and you can step out onto a dock or step out onto a jetty. And every other landing in Antarctica is going to be what we call a wet landing. And that is going to be that the zodiac is going to take you from the ship to the shoreline or to the icy shoreline or to the ice even if we get out and step on ice. And you're going to step out of the zodiac and onto the land. When you do that, you usually are going to step in six inches, eight inches of water, something like that. So it really is critical that you have boots that are waterproof, that are warm. Uh, we have a great boot that you can rent on the ship. So if you don't want to bring boots, there's rental boots on the ship that you can get. Um, and you're going to just simply sit on the pontoon of the boat, which is about 20 inches off of the water. You just pivot on your bottom, put your feet on the on the land, and, and walk out. And uh, you're immediately up on shore and going. But you are going to have what we call wet landings. So the vast majority of your landings will be getting in and out of the zodiac in water that when you step out will be six or eight inches deep, and you quickly scooch up onto the shore and you're you know you're there. Um, don't just bring you know garden variety boots is one thing that I would tell everybody. Love the boots that you have. If you can try them in advance, that's even best. We love neoprene boots, a company like um, the Arctic Sport, which is made by a company called Muck Boot. The Boggs boots are great. Uh, a, a neoprene boot that has a good sole on it uh, for slippage on ice and snow, but also keeping you fully waterproof because you will be stepping into a few inches of water. Well, Michael, you said you can rent them on the ship? You can. I honestly don't know the details of costs, but I'm there okay. helping hand them out. And I know people can reserve boots in advance and well, use them for the trip. That was my next question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so they're there on the, on the uh, ship when you get there, and it's and they're part of your luggage. And, of course, you have so many restrictions for uh, weights and, and um, checked lab baggage these days. It's wonderful to have the opportunity, and these are great boots. I mean, these are these are the boots that the staff wear. So these are the boots to have, and you can absolutely rent them. And we've got all the sizes, and we even have if you know if you think you're a nine and in this boot you're really an eight, we've got extra pairs of them to make sure that you've got the right size boots for the expedition. And I would say probably yeah. half of people now uh, on our expeditions are renting their boots rather than yeah. bringing their own down. I think weight-wise, like you already touched on, um, makes more sense for me, anyway, to rent a boot once you get on the ship. They can be heavy. I mean, a good pair of boots, of yep. course, is going to be, I don't know what they are, six or eight pounds probably. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the ones that I'm talking about, these neoprene, uh, they're just, they're bomber boots. They're perfect because you don't, and the other thing is once you get ashore, when you're hiking around and walking around, you might have to cross a meltwater stream. You might be walking in penguin guano. I mean, all sorts of things that you want a boot that you can just take a hose to and a brush and scrub and clean when it's all over with. And that's why these waterproof neoprene boots are just phenomenal. They're, they're the perfect footwear for these expeditions. And it's the one thing you do not want to skimp on on your expedition. I mean, you want a good pair of boots. A lot of people think, well, I'll go down and get a pair of cheap Wellingtons, and and you know they're they're waterproof, but they're not immune to the cold. They don't have a good sole on them, uh, and they just don't. You know, you're going to be hours on snow and ice and walking around and all of this stuff. Good boots, good boots are going to be a necessity. Okay, thank you. I have a question about camera equipment. Um, you touched on what camera equipment. Um, but how does the cold affect the camera equipment that you've got if you have an SLR um, or DSLR? And also, how do you operate it with gloves on? Oh, oh now you're into my life. Uh, <laughs> the cold definitely zaps batteries. Not as badly as you think. I would tell you a lot of people are surprised it's not as cold as they believe it's going to be. And so you do see a, a shortened life of the batteries. So it's very important that everybody bring extra batteries. And honestly, you need to bring extra cards because you're going to take way more pictures than you ever guessed. We have people on expeditions who will shoot 20, 30, 40,000 images in a 12-day trip. And they just had no idea they were going to you know, shoot that much. But the opportunities are that great. You're right there next to the wildlife. You're right in the thick of it. 
just being on the ship in the twilight hours, getting up early, I mean, you've got uh, shooting possibilities left and right. So extra batteries are a must. Remember the battery charger. Uh, the ship is run on 220, but most uh, chargers will work on uh, 220 these days, so 110 to 240. Uh, check your charger, but I mean any charger that was has been built in the last eight years is uh, dual voltage, so that's not an issue whatsoever. Um, if they get cold, if you're out there in the field and the battery dies, one little trick is to pull the battery out and put it in your gloved hand between your skin and the glove, inside your glove, let it warm up for five or ten minutes, and you'll get some more life out of that battery. But spare batteries, spare cards, and then in terms of gloves, if you could design the perfect gloves, I think you would make a mint. Some people go with heavier gloves to keep themselves warm, but then it's hard to work the uh, different buttons and functions on the camera. I personally use a light layer of Kapolein warming, uh, liner gloves, and then I've got heavy wool gloves that go over that that are fingerless and then have a little mitten cover that can come down over the fingers when I'm not shooting. But an excellent question and, yeah, one to be thought through. Okay, I have a question about the gloves as well. Um, is there any way you can go without gloves? There are people who go without gloves and there are certainly days you know, all, it ha all that has to happen is for the sun to be out and the wind to be down, and suddenly you've got light and energy bouncing off ice everywhere around you. I am not kidding. I have seen people strip down to t-shirts and shorts in this time of year. I mean, you're at the height of summer, and if 40 degrees, 45 degrees, sometimes 50 degrees, that's going to feel like a summer day in the northern hemisphere because of all that radiation, of all that reflected light. And and energy around you. And so there are times you could potentially go without gloves. Um, and of course it just depends on what part of the, of the country you're from. You know, if you live in LA, anything is going to seem cold to you. And so you're going to be saying, I absolutely can't live without gloves. But if you're from Buffalo, you might have been out shoveling snow without gloves and you might be perfectly good with it. For me, myself, and I'm fairly good in the cold weather, but I would tell you that I like a lightweight liner pair at least, and uh, just a really thin, easy, I, I prefer Kapolein because it's moisture wicking, uh, but they certainly are not heavy gloves, and then I put my other gloves over those, the fingerless ones, just to kind of do for warmth. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Well, I know you mentioned um, a, a GoPro, or, you know, and a waterproof, that kind of thing. Um, do you do you prefer any one waterproof camera to another? At this point, I would uh, tell you that what I see in the field, as I work with guests who are bringing these cameras, I think the Olympus is right up there, one of the better ones. And they've just come out with a new model, and I want to say TX4. Uh, the Canon has a, a camera called the D20. Both of these are four to five hundred dollar aim and create cameras. Um, they're completely waterproof. So whether you're kayaking or you're splashing around at the shoreline, or you're actually you know in that situation where uh, a seal might be right beside the, the zodiac and you can lower it into the water, that's great. GoPros are everywhere these days. I mean, <laughs> I went to Disneyland about six months ago and. Everybody had a GoPro strapped to their head. You know, I mean, it's just this is probably the most ubiquitous of the cameras. And the nice thing about the GoPros is they're an ultra wide angle lens. You can stick them on either a walking stick or a selfie stick, something where you can put that camera in the ice under the water and get a couple of feet down, and you're not putting your hands in the water, and uh, get them to shoot either video or you can put them on uh, time lapse so the camera's taking a picture every half of a second or something. And the GoPro seems to be a really nice way to go. And of course, the big advantage for the GoPro is it's just so small and it's fully waterproof. So, you know, these are solutions that I think are just great. We're seeing more and more people using them. And, uh, and you know, you can't put the other cameras on little sticks, but they're not as well adapted to it as the GoPro is. So the GoPro is a pretty decent underwater system. And again, I think GoPros are at about 300 bucks. 350 right. bucks, something yeah. like that. In my world of cameras, that's you know that's nothing. 
I mean, you know, you know what the cost of the trip is, and uh, right. it's going to be worth it to you to have have those images as a memory of the trip. So. What about filters? Did you use starlight filters in some of your uh, photos? You know, I actually control that with the aperture. These days, okay. every filter that I use, including split neutral density filters, are done in the digital darkroom. I use a product by Adobe called Lightroom, and uh, I apply filtration afterwards. The only exception at this point is a polarizer. That is the one filter that cannot be yeah. reproduced in Lightroom. So the only filters that I have on any of my lenses are um, polarizing filters, and that's for times when the water is calm and I want to see in, into the water. So I want to cut the glare on the water surface. So the whale shot next to the bow of the ship, that was a polarized shot so that we could get a really good look at the whale. Um, otherwise, controlling those starbursts or sunbursts are done with high aperture numbers. If you shoot it at f8, f11, f16, you'll get those sunbursts uh, as opposed to shooting at f2.8 or 4, f5.6. That won't give you those individual rays of light. So the sunburst is all a matter of the aperture that you choose to shoot the shot in. Okay, thank you. And, and honestly, I don't know if that made sense or if it was Greek, but it's something we talk about in the breakout session on the ship. This is one of the things we'll teach you, how to make those sunbursts with your camera. Thank you. The, the problem is for me at this point, I'm looking at these pictures and I'm, I'm, I'm packing. I'm ready to go. <laughs> you know, I'm ready to go too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm ready to go. And... Um, it's very exciting. It's a, it's a, and the thing, the problem is also, I will get off the phone and I will have more questions than I can, my brain can even accommodate. Bruno, email well, them to me you know, and I will get them to I, both Michael and Lisa. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I was going to say we're happy. I probably get three, four, five emails a day from people from all over the world going on an expedition. And I just got one this morning. Michael, I'm headed to the Amazon on the Delphin 2, which is one of our ships that we do the Amazon River trip on, asking me what cameras to bring. And I am happy to answer questions about cam uh, uh, what cameras to bring. The only caveat I always put is that I'm usually out on the ships, and so it might take a couple to a few days to get back, but I'm always good for it. I'll always email you back. It just might take a little while. Uh, to get it to you, but I'll always give you an answer if you have camera questions. And the other photo instructors do the same thing. I mean, this is we eat, sleep, and drink this stuff. This is this is what drives us. This is what gets us up in the morning and uh, just ready to go. So we love to talk about this kind of stuff. I could just chew your ear off about photography, and uh, you're never going to run out of. Uh, I mean, I'll always be able to answer questions for you. Thank you. And the jackets, the jackets that, I, that we're seeing, they, Patty and I talked briefly about them, but not enough for me to remember or know. <laughs> um, you actually receive your jacket. Um, you'll be given an option to pick your size, and uh, the jackets will be sent to you. Now, those, they're a great jacket, and Michael, I know I've, I have one. Um, and I know, Michael, you've probably got yours as well, but they have a zip-out liner, so they're they're perfect if it gets hot down there. You can you can take off the out the inner layer, just put the outer layer on. But there, are lots of pockets, lots of space to put things. Okay. Yeah, I have to say, as a piece of equipment, the jacket is phenomenal. It it is what you would want. I mean, you know, Lisa is saying that you can unzip the liner out. In a sense, you have three jackets because you can wear the two combined, so that you have the inner liner and the outer waterproof shell which actually has a hood and a chin flap and can close really tightly about you. And then you also have a liner, so you can wear the liner by itself, the shell by itself, or the two in combination for the days so when it's really cold. They've got great uh, arm fasteners and lots and lots of pack, uh, pockets, and they really are waterproof. They're excellent jackets, so that is provided on the expedition, and that's another thing that, you know, I mean, it's just, it's the perfect gear. You know, for me, it's so important that you bring the proper headgear so, you know, so much of our body heat is lost out of our head, about 25%. So a good cap, a good woolen cap, a capoline cap, something that you really, really are comfortable with and covers your ears, good gloves, 
this jacket that we're going to provide, and if you rent them, the boots that we provide, and then the only last layer is waterproof pants. And they can be either slip-over pants that will go over other pants for you, or they can be aligned pants. Uh, they can be ski pants. They could be bibs if they want. But the idea is to be windproof and waterproof and have hands and head covered. And, uh, you know, and then you're set. You're set for anything, whatever's going to happen there. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Will I hang up? Yeah. Mommy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at my notes here, and they're all over the place. Um, okay. We'll type them up and send them out to everybody. Okay, good. Now, if I might, just as one resource, and that is, uh, you know, we do have incredible lists and ideas of what to bring, everything from photography to clothing. We have a thing called the Daily Expedition Report. On every single expedition around the world that Lindblad runs, a staff member every single day writes a summary of that day. You can go on our website at expeditions.com, look under Daily Expedition Report, and look for December 27th for the last 15 years, and you can see what happened in Antarctica in the last 15 years on December 27th or December 28th, or how we rang in the new year. So you can get an idea of the places they went, the animals they saw, the conditions that they were in. There's photographs, there's text, and it's just a great way for you to be able to look up and see what has happened in the past, just to give you a feeling for it for that time of year, what stage are the penguins going to be in, how do the whales look, what's the ice look like, and you can check out the daily expedition reports, and they're a great resource. And we find that a lot of Lindblad guests use that before they go. I'll get that all the time. Oh, I've been following the daily, we call them DERs for short, daily expedition report. I've been following the DERs, and I know everything the ship's done for the last two weeks because I'm so excited I've been following. But you can go back in time and check out what's been happening in December and all the years leading up to this. Michael, would you give me that website again? I'll email it to you. Okay, yeah. thanks, honey. It, it's super easy. It's expeditions.com. Uh, that's what I wrote. Okay. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Lisa and Michael, thank you so much for spending the last hour with us and sharing your experience and your expertise. I am so excited about this trip um, and I know that the people that have already signed up are so if there's anybody else that you know that would like to, um, those of you that are here, I'm going to share this with people that have um, told me they'd like to go but couldn't make this but contact your Cruising Co. travel consultant um, and you too can be on an expedition with us to Antarctica. Thank you. Uh, thank you thank everybody. You. Thank you. Thank you so much.